It's actually, this is a short trip for me. I'm used to 15, 20 hour trips, and this was just a jaunt there across the state line, so that wasn't bad at all. So, well, we're glad you made it out. We will hopefully get to meet you and talk with you during these sessions, and I would definitely encourage you to meet other people around you and talk with them during these sessions. And we're gonna be playing with the sound here a little bit because it's not directly connected in, so I'll try to speak at a normal thing and see if they can get it up loud enough where you can actually hear me. But it, it, um, it's a little, little different, but hopefully you have a manual. They should have told you back there at the desk we'll be using a manual. Now, if you don't get a manual, I will tell you, the manuals are about 98% scripture. So if you don't get a manual, if you have a Bible, you'll still do okay, all right? The Bible should always be our primary manual, amen? amen. <clears throat> so now what we did with the manual is that we actually put some other materials in there, but it's just some basic things and kind of how we run things during the seminar. <clears throat> but essentially, the, the difference between the Bible and the manual is that the manual gives you the same scriptures, but it gives you lines where you can make notes and do all that kind of thing. So uh, when I taught this in Australia, I told the people, pull out your manual, and they didn't have any. We didn't have these at that time. And they all looked around like, where do I get a manual? And I said, that's, that's called your Bible. That's your manual. So <clears throat> we actually use that. So if you do have a Bible, we can use that today. Um, <clears throat> just the manual that we'll be using, actually, in the very front page, I think it's page one, yes, has the basic ground rules. Hopefully they told you to read those if you got that. And it basically just says, first off, to silence all your cell phones and <clears throat> pagers or whatever else. I don't know if people still use pagers anymore. But um, it also says no personal recording or recording devices allowed during the entirety of the meeting. We'll be running these sessions for about 45 minute uh, sessions at a time. And then we'll take about a 10 or 15 minute break in between. <coughs> Excuse me, if you, we are recording these, so if you can try to keep from walking in front of the cameras the best you can, unless you want to be seen all over the world, because these will go all over the world. They will see your face or whatever part of your body you put toward the camera, they will see it all over the world, all right? Just letting you know ahead of time. So, <clears throat> and they usually end up on the internet somewhere. Now, also, if you need ministry, if you need healing, you need some ministry going on in your body or in any area of your life, <clears throat> we can do that. Now, we will be having a healing service on Saturday night, but if you're in pain, then don't wait till Saturday night. Now, the good thing is, the guys that are with me all can do what I can do, all right? They've been trained, they get results, it works. <clears throat> One thing you're gonna hear over and over again in any seminar I'm at, technically, you don't need me, right? So, so don't try to make me the guy, all right? I'm not the guy, okay? Jesus is the guy, amen? amen? And if we have him in us, then any person that has him in them should be able to do what anybody else that has him in them can do, right. amen? You may have to decipher some of that, but <clears throat> I'm down south, so y'all can understand me, all right? When I go up north, they have a problem up there understanding y'all and fixing and Ghana and things like that. They don't understand that, but <clears throat> down here, we're just all family, so I can talk this way, amen? <laughs> now, so, but if you need ministry, be sure to uh, get a hold of one of my guys. They can pray for you. Now, I will say this. During the breaks, <clears throat> it's a break. You're sitting, I'm standing for 45 minutes. The break is for me more than you. Okay, I'll just be blunt. Uh, it gives me a chance to go back and sit down or something like that. However, I do like to fellowship with you. I do like to talk with you. Um, usually don't have time during the breaks to really answer a question because if I answer a question, it takes a whole break. So if you can, uh, you can write questions down, get them to me. <clears throat> we have kind of a schedule with this that we want to keep. And I really believe that most of your questions are going to be answered during this. Uh, how many of you have been to a DHT? You've been through our divine healing training. Oh, good. Okay. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> this is what makes that work. You know, just bluntly, that's the way it is. It's, this is why when you minister to the sick, why they get healed. Okay. And the more you understand this, the faster things happen. Now I will say everywhere I've taught this, we have seen more healings taking place in people that just sit and listen to it than sometimes we see in our divine healing technician training healing lines. So it is a, a just as the front of the cover says, it is a revelation of, of Christ in you. And what I'm going to be sharing you, the beauty of this, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm blessed to be able to preach this message because 
if you read what Jesus said in the Gospels, it was almost always, he was always saying in that day, at this time. And it was almost always future, and it was always leading up to something. When Paul started writing, it was always past tense. So something happened between Jesus and Paul, and we know that to be the crucifixion, the resurrection. So what took place is what we're going to be talking about. Now, the beauty of it is, this is not, nothing I'm going to be telling you is what you must attain. It's not some level you're going to reach. What I'm going to be sharing with you is what has already happened, right? This is done. Now, the problem is, <clears throat> many times people don't realize what has happened, so they don't walk in what was provided. So during these sessions, we're going to be sharing with you what is already there. Now, in, probably in the next session, we're spe specifically going to be covering spirit, soul, and body and the difference. Because the biggest problem is in the area of your mind. Your spirit, if you are right with God, you are right with God. Amen. All right? If you're born again, you are right with God. Now, the problem is you must renew your mind. We're going to see this even in the, the teaching. We're going to go through some of the aspects of it. And we go through this in the DHD also, that the real battle is not with the devil. The devil's a defeated foe. That's not the battle. What he tries to do is try to get you to operate in the unrenewed soul. That's the carnal aspect. If he can get you out into the carnal, he can beat you. That's, but our weapons are not carnal, Paul said. Our weapons are mighty through God. They are spiritual, and that's how we win. So the enemy always wants to pull us out of the spiritual into the natural. Amen? So that the key is to learn who you are, who Christ is in you. And now, the way I've described it, even in the DHT at times, is that it's as if the mind is running this way, and your spirit is running this way. And because of that, there's interference. Your spirit cannot be expressed except through the soul and through your body. It has to come, what is in your spirit is born of God. We will look at those scriptures specifically. But your spirit is right with God. It is complete. And we're, again, I'll bring all these scriptures out and show you them in, in, the, in the Bible itself. And what's in there wants to get out. That is God wanting to reveal himself to the world. The hindrance is in our soul. As long as you think naturally, as long as you think, I don't want to say worldly because that has kind of a different connotation to it. Naturally is the best way to say it. <clears throat> but when you, as long as you think like normal humans think, then that is contrary to the way the spirit thinks. And, is, and unfortunately, if you think of something and you want to say something that is in your spirit, it's wanting to come out. If your mind is working against you, then your spirit cannot express itself the way it wants to. So, and many times the spirit will, almost, it's almost as if, and this is the best way I can kind of say it, and I know we're jumping right into this, all right. <clears throat> but it is as if your spirit is, have you ever tried to say something spiritually, like I'm doing now and can't get it out? Have you ever tried to say something <laughs> out of the spirit? And you've got the concept. You understand what you're trying to say. But there are no words that fully say what you're trying to say. Well, that's because spirit is so much higher than natural and is so much bigger <clears throat> than just natural human words. Human words can't convey the glory that is truly in the spirit. And you know, as we've said before, it's like trying to describe a sunset to a blind person. Right? You, you can say it all kinds of ways, but none of them even all together quite ever really get across the real feeling that you're trying to bring across. Well, your spirit thinks more in terms of general overall concept. Imagine trying to, let's say you're a calculus teacher at some college, and you're trying to explain to a five-year-old calculus. Right? You know it. You know what you're trying to get across. But you're trying to say, how can I get this across to this person? It's kind of hard to do, right? Because the words, you're trying to, to get the words to fit their understanding. 
That's the way the spirit is to the natural mind. The natural mind is so far below the spirit that it's actually hard for the spirit to, to bring it across sometimes into our natural mind. But as your mind is renewed to the word of God, now it can understand the concepts of God. And because of that, you can say one word and boom, instantly you know it. Right? Because it's like trying to describe everything you know in a word. You can't put everything you know in one word. Right? Well, Jesus. There you go. Okay, we did. But <clears throat> instead of contradicting myself, I'd rather just say it's easier to try to get the concept of, across. Well, your spirit knows everything. There is nothing right now you don't know. You just don't know you don't know it or that you know it. I mean, yeah. the Bible says that you know all things in 1 John chapter 2, verse 20, verse 27. He says, you know all things. You have no need that any man teach you. And you think, well, how is that? You know, then why are there teachers in the body? It's because teachers in the body are not teaching you because you are a spirit. They are trying to renew your mind, which is not you. All right? Do you understand that? It's not totally you. It's a part of you. So <clears throat> you are complete. You are perfect inside, in the spirit. Now, our job is to renew the mind so that instead of the mind working against what the spirit wants to do, now the mind lines up and now the spirit can flow freely out through the soul and then can be expressed through the body, through the hands laying on and different words and things like that. So <clears throat> that's what this seminar is about, is not to get you, not to bring you something you don't already have. It is to reveal to you what you already have. Amen? So this is not something you're going to attain. It's not some high exalted level you're going to get to. You're going to start understanding where you were placed. It'd be similar to you know, becoming president of the United States. One day you're not, the next day you are. Well, when you walk in that office, automatically you're not going to know everything about it and you're going to feel somewhat inadequate, you know, ill-prepared. I mean, how can you prepare for a position you've never been in? And you can be told about it. You can hear other people tell you that have been there. Yeah, when you get there, it's going to be like this. But until you're there, you don't know. Well, that's kind of the way we are in the Christian church, that we have been put into a position, but because we don't know we're there and we don't know what we have, we don't know how to walk in the position we've been put in. So this entire seminar is revealing to you what is. It's not future. This is not an end times. It's not a, you know, on the other side seminar. It's going to sound like it because it's going to be so good. In other words, what's in here. I'm telling you, if I try to read this at night before I go to bed, forget it. I'm not sleeping because <laughs> it, it, it just comes alive because it is so good when you actually read it and believe it. Yeah. Amen. When you look at it, not as, wow, these guys were really spiritual and I hope someday I'll be there. But when you look at it and take these words for yourself, that this is who you are in Christ, everything changes. All of a sudden, you know, we read where Jesus said, you know, if, if you're with God, nothing should be impossible to you. And we read that and, and we, we agree. You know, uh, Kenyon used to call that mental assent. We agree with it. We don't believe it, but we agree with it. You know, because if we believed it, then all things would truly be possible and be happening. Right? But we agree with it. Yeah, all things are possible to them that, that, that believe that are in God or in Christ. But the truth of the matter is this. Once you start getting a hold of what I'm teaching you, when I started I saw bits and pieces of it for years. I, I taught it through the, through the DHT in bits and pieces. It would come out in bursts, and it would be little bits of what I would say is like revelation. But it's amazing because when it actually, all of a sudden, like I said, I've been doing this now for, well, I've been teaching the, the uh, Divine Healing Technician training for about 12, 13 years, 14 years now. But in the last, I would say, year and a half, even though the DHT worked, even though we've seen thousands healed, we've seen nine come back from the dead, actually more than that now, but we've seen just amazing miracles. But in the last year and a half, very frankly, things have gotten so easy. And it's, it's gotten where it's actually harder not to believe than it is to believe. And when you hear someone talk in unbelief, it's almost as if you don't get them. You don't understand them. It's like, 
you know, where do you live? You know, in, in your head, where are you living? Because that's not what this says. And since then, it's been amazing because you, instead of, and now listen carefully, instead of having to pray and push through and hit these things, it's gotten where you think about something and it happens. It, it's that simple, right? That's what comes out of this. Now, I'm not saying I'm walking in the fullness of it because I'm not, but the burst that I've been walking at has been amazing, right? And it is, it is so fun, okay? So as we go through this, we'll see this. I, I do want to hit the rest of these real quick and I'm going to have to, we don't have a clock? Okay. Try to find, I ah, have to use this. You have to help me keep up with my time because I'm telling you this, I, I don't do sermons, right? This is alive. I could teach this till midnight tonight, no problem, right? Honestly, without breaks. I mean, I'm serious because when you start talking about this, it's you, I, I, I don't want it to sound mystical and all that kind of stuff because that's not what it is. It is so, it, living spiritually becomes so natural that you don't get weird. You know, Jesus wasn't weird, all right? He walked through crowds, he got dust on his feet, and yet kids would want to run up to him, right? They didn't run away from him because he looked weird and acted weird, right? He didn't scare people away. <clears throat> the love of God was in him, emanating from him to the point where it drew people. Even demon-possessed people ran to him, all right? And ran to him and said, you know, what are you doing? Why you, did you come to torment us? What? Hello, you came to me. I didn't come to you, you know. <clears throat> but that's, it becomes natural to walk in this. And so as we, if, if you will take this to heart, if you will read along and realize that when we read this, it's amazing. We're reading about Jesus, but we're reading about you. Why? Because the one thing you're going to have to get over is yourself. Okay, you're going to have to quit dividing what God has joined. And he has joined himself to you. So quit dividing between you and God. You and God walking together are one. Amen? Now, you may not, be, you may not have walked that way. This may be foreign to you. But that's where you're called to walk. It's who you are. And it's going to take some getting used to. And believe me, when you start talking this way, you're going to do two things. You're going to draw some people and you're going to repel some people, right? Religious people are going to hate you. I'm, I'm not kidding. They're going to chase you off. They're going to say, their first statement is usually, who do you think you are? You know, and really what I try to answer back is, you know, I don't think about me anymore. So I don't, I really don't know who I am and I'm still finding out. Amen. Amen. So, but it's, and I had one guy ask me one time, you know, who died and made you king? <laughs> Jesus. You know, that's, amen. That's who died and made me. He made me a king and a priest unto my God through his death, burial, and resurrection. So there you go. Amen. But people don't, religious people don't like it when you start walking in, in power, in revelation, and in freedom. Right? Religion hates freedom. It wants bondage. It wants regimentation. Amen. And what we're going to see through this is that the teachings that we're going to get into, you have to remember, Jesus made it, well, I'm really jumping in here. If, if, you, have a, is, if you have a manual, just read the front. All right, that, it, it talks about there's no charge for attending. Uh, we would take up offerings. There'd be no offering during the healing service on Saturday evening. Just typical like we do at the DHT. Um, if you need information about some of the materials and stuff, it's at the book table. I'll be talking about some of them probably. We have information about our Bible school, the church in Dallas, life teams, license ordination, all that stuff. It's all back there. We can get you into that. I'll introduce our team to you at some point. Um, yeah, and then the breaks are for me as much as for you, so give me a chance to rest during the breaks. Pretty much it. Now, I'm trying to hurry up and get into this because I've been teaching and preaching for you know 20 years. And this is the most exciting thing I've ever had the privilege of sharing. I mean, it's, it's amazing. And I'm going to make some, if you've been through the DHT, 
I make some pretty blunt statements, okay? Just point blank. Well, if you thought that was blunt, you ain't heard nothing yet, okay? Because <laughs> we get even further than that this time. But I, I do on page uh, two of the manual. Now, these are just facts, okay? First off, John J. Lake Ministries is the oldest healing ministry in existence. It has more documented healings than any ministry in history. It has the highest success rate of healing in ministry today. Therefore, John Lake Ministries is the oldest, most experienced, most successful healing ministry in existence today. These are facts, all right? And it is the acknowledged authority concerning healing and operating in the power of God. The people we teach function in the power of God. It's just that simple. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. I'm not making any excuses for it. Um, that's just the way it is. We believe the Bible. We practice the Bible. We <clears throat> stick as close to the Bible as we possibly know how. And we're constantly finding ways to get closer. Right, and so it, you, you'll hear some things going on. Then we have some endorsements. If you want to know, if you know, or if you want to know if people think what they think of us, this is what some people think of us. Right? Uh, if you want to know what other people think of us, you have to go on the internet. I'm not going to print what they say. Okay. Um, and then the basic principles on page four. If you and the reason I put this in there is because if you are come into contact with someone saying that they represent John Julek Ministries they will follow these principles. If they violate these principles, they're not part of us, right? Just real simple. So if they say, uh, you know, if you want to be healed, make a vow offering and give a $1,000 or something, okay, that's a lie, first off. And secondly, if they do that, please contact me because they will not be, well, they're not part of John Julek Ministries. And if they say they are, they won't be. If they have been, they won't be anymore, amen? You cannot buy what Jesus has already purchased. All right? It is by grace that we are healed. It's by grace that we minister healing. It's all there. All right? So let's just be grateful and thank God for it. Receive it. Walk in it. Amen? Um, there's a bunch of other things in here, but you can read through that. Now, the, the very beginning is, is the setup for this because we need to have some ground rules, I guess you would say, to be able to understand some of this stuff. So first off, what I'm going to be teaching you, again, is what makes the healing work, okay? It's not a formula, and, it's, and this seminar is not about healing. The beauty of it is whatever you need can be met, not just healing. Uh, anything, you know, deliverance, freedom, uh, addictions broken, all that stuff, uh, finances, all that comes through this because it's accepting where you are, not trying to get there. Amen? That's, that's the big key. Now, the thing, the first off, on, on page 8, if you have the manual, it says, Paul's gospel is the continuing teachings of Jesus. Now, Jesus in John 16, verse 12, it says, he said, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Now, the key to understanding the Bible is always to look at who was talking, who were they talking to, and when was it said? Right? You have to realize, was it said before the cross, after the cross? Who was Jesus talking to? I always tell everybody in the DHT, remember, Jesus never dealt with a Christian. He never dealt with a Christian, right? There were no Christians in Jesus' day. Amen? Nobody was born again. Nobody had the Spirit of God the way we have the Spirit of God now. So the things that Jesus said, he was trying to... He proclaimed the kingdom. He said, this is what, you ever notice? He said, this is what the kingdom is like. Why? Because they weren't in it. He was always trying to show them what it's like. And he was trying to describe, if you're going to walk in kingdom principle, this is the way you're going to walk. This is the way you're going to live. You want to be great in the kingdom? Fine, no problem. Serve. See, he didn't say, oh, you want to be great in the kingdom? Well, you dirty dog, why would you want to be great? You selfish, prideful thing. He didn't say that. He said, you want to be great? Wonderful. We need great people in the kingdom. And the way you get great in the kingdom is you serve more people. Amen. Right? So there's, God has no problem with you being great because that means more people are going to be served. Amen. Amen? So he said, now if you're trying to get great out of a wrong motive, he said, it's not going to be among you like it is among the Gentiles where you lord over one another. People think being in charge, being lording over people, that that's greatness. That's not greatness. Greatness is serving. Greatness is facilitating people, empowering people to do the work of the ministry, to reach out and touch lives and to teach them how to serve other people. That's great in the kingdom. Amen? 
not how many people you're over, how many churches you're over, all that kind of stuff, because that can all be done by just good management principles, right? It doesn't take good spirituality to get to a high level in churchianity. Amen? Now, the thing to remember is that there were things that Jesus said, I can't teach you. There's things I would love to share with you, but you can't bear them now. But he said, how be it when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. That means that Jesus did not expound all truth to them. He gave them pieces of the truth, but there were pieces that they could not bear. So there was going, Jesus made it very clear. There's going to come a time when the spirit comes, which is after he left, that the spirit is going to lead you into truth and there's going to be more revelation and he said, there's things I want to teach you, but you can't bear them now. And then we know that later, Paul had an interview, actually extended interviews with Jesus himself, and received revelation from Jesus. And the revelation that he received were the teachings that Jesus could not share with people while he was on the earth. So the teachings of Paul, the revelation of Paul, is nothing more than the continued teaching of Jesus. Amen? Amen. People say, well, Paul disagrees with Jesus. Well, that would be impossible because Paul's teachings were Jesus' teachings. All right? Now, what you have to understand is Paul was talking to different people than Jesus was talking to. So if, if I told, I, I would tell a sinner, an unsaved person, you have to be careful how you say things because, you know, I don't want to offend people unnecessarily. I don't, I don't mind offending. It's just unnecessarily I don't want to do it. All right? <laughs> so but the, the idea is that if I'm going to speak to, a, to an unsaved person, I'm not going to tell them the same thing I'm going to tell a Christian, right? And I'm not going to tell a Christian the same thing I would tell an unsaved person. I would tell an unsaved person, you need to repent. You need to turn around. You need to turn your life around. You need to come to God. You need to seek God, which is in a term meaning you need to come to Him. In reality, God's been seeking them because that's what Jesus said. He said, I came to seek and to save them which were lost, right? So even the terminology we use sometimes, we need to kind of bring it up to date, right? Because we still use some old terminology that just didn't accurate. But I wouldn't tell a, an unsaved person the same thing I would tell a saved person. And I'm not going to tell a saved person, you know, you need to seek God. Well, hopefully, if you're saved, guess what? You done found him, yeah. right? You don't need to seek that which you found, right? Now, I would tell you, you need to walk with him. You need to have your mind renewed so you can... God, you cannot do anything to make God love you more. Amen? He loves you as much as he will ever love you. Now, however, there are things you can do that can give God more pleasure through you. Yeah. Amen? For instance, we know it, it takes faith to please God. So if you walk in faith, you're going to bring God more pleasure than if you don't walk in faith. Amen? But it, you're never going to make him love you more. So, but you can bring him more pleasure through your life by walking in faith. Do you realize we think sometimes I have to get enough faith to get this from God? And we don't realize that it's faith that pleases God. It's not that we're using faith to get it from God. It's that our using faith and walking in faith brings him pleasure. You understand? So whenever you're saying, well, you know, I need a new car. Okay, I'm going to believe God for a new car. I hope it's his will that I get a new car. Okay, if you can use faith toward it, that's bringing him pleasure that you're believing him that he will bring you that car. Amen? It's not about you. It's about him. If your faith is in him and you're using faith brings him pleasure. You think God cares about a car? God doesn't care about a car. He didn't care what you drive. He didn't care if you drive something that barely got you here or something that got you here in comfort. He doesn't care. That's really your choice. How, what do you want to take your time to use your faith for? Now, some cases, it's like I've told people before, even in the DHT, uh, some people would, maybe they have a headache and they go, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to believe God for healing of the headache. Okay, but now if, the, if it's going to take you all day to believe for the healing of the headache and in, and in that time you're going to sit at home and do nothing and not touch any other lives, go take an aspirin and go out and pray for people. <laughs> you understand? You get that? Because what, what is happening is the devil's winning. If he can get you to stay at home and just fight for yourself, he's won. But if you will get up and go, you know what? Okay, I'll take an aspirin. I'll go out, get your mind off of you. Usually if you do that and drink some water, your headache will leave anyway, just to be honest with you. Now, you think it's the aspirin. It's not. It's the water you take with the aspirin that actually makes the headache go away. Anyway, <laughs> that's just <laughs> things they don't take. You ever, you ever notice they tell you, 
If you're on a weight loss program, the first thing they tell you is, take this, but, and take it with a full glass of water 30 minutes before you eat. Well, if you just don't take the thing, but you drink a full glass of water 30 minutes before you eat, you'll still eat less, right? right? And you don't have to buy the stupid little pill or whatever it is, okay? So, <laughs> that's as much as we're going to get into weight loss here, okay? Yeah. <laughs> or nutrition or anything else, okay? Because you don't want me to go there on nutrition, all right? Now, but what I'm saying is that the enemy is trying to keep you self-centered. And if you, you know, if you, could, if you need to take an aspirin so that you can get your mind off your pain and go out and pray for 10, 15 people, then you have defeated him. Amen. And the purpose of the headache has been defeated. Amen? You understand? Just don't get in bondage over it. I mean, if you set yourself and go, I will never take medicine again. Okay, that's wonderful. That's good. Just don't get into bondage over this stuff. Amen? Now, I mean, I, you know, medicine works to some degree, but it's not the best. Amen? So, now, he, but I want to get across. What we're going to be sharing with you is Jesus' teaching. It just came through Paul. But it, since it came after Jesus' resurrection, then he is, he is going to talk differently than Jesus talked to people who were not born again. Yeah. Right? And he was, because, and you have to look at the difference between the Old Covenant and New Covenant. We'll talk about that while we're here. The Old Covenant was always, don't do this, don't do that. And it's, have you ever noticed that's how you teach kids? Yeah. Right? You don't tell a child, look, just do right. Because the kids say, I, I don't know what right is. <laughs> Right? You have to tell them, don't do that. Don't do this. Don't touch the stove. Right? It's hot. It will burn you. Don't do that. Don't do this. Don't take the toy away from the other child. You have to, everything is don't. As long as you live in don'ts, you're living in the childhood stage of Christianity. Christianity is not about the don'ts. It's about the do's. Right? You do reach out. You do touch lives. You pray for others. You give to others. You do unto others. Jesus didn't come with a thou shalt not. He came with a thou shalt. Thou shalt love the God, thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Thou shalt do unto others as you would have done. That's what Jesus taught. Right? He didn't go around saying don't do this. Stop doing that. Don't do that. Amen? But yet the church has hung up on the don'ts. Right? Now what I've found is if you get so busy doing the do's, you don't have time to do the don'ts. Right? right? And, and, once you, and a lot of doing the don'ts, I'm saying doing the don'ts, a lot of that is just habit. You just do the don'ts because you're in the habit of doing the don'ts. Right? And what you need to do is break the habit of doing the don'ts. And the best way to break the habits of doing the don'ts is to do the do's. <laughs> Amen? I know this is deep theology. I know. I know it. Okay? <laughs> But have you ever noticed the simple people understood Jesus? It was the trained theologians that didn't get it, right? Maybe we should really take that principle to heart sometimes. And I had a guy tell me the other day, he's, a, you know, he's no theologian, no Bible scholar. And I'm like, thank you. You know, I mean, that's what I'm thinking inside. Thank you. you know, it's, and, and I tell people, I've never claimed to be a Bible theologian or a Bible scholar. I tell everybody, I know just a few things that work really good, right? <laughs> And if everything else, I'm learning as I go. But I know, I know enough to help people. Amen? And so if anything else he wants to teach me, he can teach me here or there. I don't care. Right? But I just want to be found busy about my father's business when the Lord returns. Amen? So, now, in, still in John 16, verse 13, on page 8 here. And do we got it? Yep, oh, we're good. In he said, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he shall show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. Now we know, and I'm going to, these are kind of disjointed a little bit, but you'll get the idea. In John 8, verse 12, it says, Then Jesus, then spoke Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Now, I, I like science, uh, especially quantum physics, things like that. I don't understand it, but I like to read about it and try to understand as much as I can. And it was amazing because Jesus was the first person in history to ever talk about dark light. Right? And now we got quantum physicists talking about dark light and that kind of thing. 
and absolute darkness, absolute cold. And Jesus said, if your eye be single, then the light in you is great. But if the light in you is dark, how great is that darkness? Now he said, if your light is dark, how great is that darkness? He didn't say you didn't have light. He just said your light was dark. Amen? So he was the first person to talk about dark light, even before modern physicist or anything else. But the amazing thing is here, he ref refers to light as being out of the life. In other words, if you have life, you have light. If you have light, you have life, right? Now, watch what he says in John chapter 9. And this is a question that comes up a lot of times in the, in the DHD. In John chapter 9, verse 1, it says, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin? This man or his parents, that he was born blind. Now that tells us right there that the idea of generational curses, as we even hear them taught today, was prevalent in Jesus' day. Right? Because he was saying, okay. Now, obviously they thought that if something like that happened, it had to come from sin, and it had to either be the person or the person's parents that sinned. So therefore the parents could pass their sin down to the child. And we know that that was taught in the Old Testament at times. Three or four different references in Exodus and Numbers and even in Deuteronomy, several places like that, was referring to the parents of the, or the sins of the parents coming down to the children. But then in Ezekiel, it says very clearly, you will never say this again. This is not true. And then he goes through the whole thing and basically just says, the person that sins, they are responsible for their own sin, right? Now, in James, it's very clear and says that if there, if there be any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and the elders will come and pray with them. And it says, and if he committed sin, if, right? Not... Obviously, if he's sick, he committed sin. It says if he's committed sin, that sin will be forgiven. So that proves that not all sickness comes from a sin or a committed sin, right? Because if it did, he couldn't have said if. He would have said, and the sin that he committed to get sick. See, but he didn't say that. So since he said if, it means that not all sickness is the result of a direct sinful action or even the result of you know, parental sin or anything like that. Now, we will look at that a little more as we go on. But here, Jesus, they said, who sinned? And Jesus answered, neither. So again, we see right here, this sickness, this blindness, did not come from sin. Right? He said, neither this man did it, nor his parents. So the, the blindness did not come from, from sin. He says, nor his parents. But that, and the word that in the Greek can be translated that, or because, or if, Several different ways, and you have to look at the context. And he said, but for instance, let's say you translate it to different ways. But, if, because, that, all right, all those different words. That because the works of God should be made manifest in him. Now, you can say it, and people say, well, see right there, God made this man blind so that Jesus could heal him to show his glory. All right, now that defies logic on every level. All right. That is so similar to what takes place in India, among other places, where the parents will take the children because there's no way for them to make a living. They will take the children out. When they're born, they will break their legs and not let them be set. And so the children's legs will be deformed and broken and they'll be crippled from birth. And then they will sit them out on the side of the road to beg because people don't give money to healthy kids, but they will give money to deformed, crippled kids out of compassion. And they do that so the kids can make a living. Now that is pagan, heathenistic mindset. That is carnality at its worst. Okay? And yet that's what people say God did to this man. God made this man blind just so he could show how good he is when he healed him. Right? Now in every level we would call that child abuse here in America. Right? And yet we accuse God of that. Now, that is not what was taking place here. This man was born blind. Jesus was saying, and, and, there's a, and the reason I'm bringing this in right now is because there are two major teachings in the church right now that in and of themselves, in their right context, are good and proper. But what, like anything else, when you take it out of its context or take it to an extreme, it becomes error, all right? There are the main two teachings that are going on in the church right now that there is a prevalence of 
is the teaching of grace, which again, obviously, there's truth. But grace taken to the wrong extreme becomes error, right? And, and unfortunately, people have rebelled so much. I say unfortunately, probably wasn't the best way to say it. But the church used to be so much in legalism that now they rebel against the legalism and they've heard the message of grace. So they go from one ditch to the other. And now it's grace and nothing matters, nothing you do matters, nothing counts, nothing changes. It's all grace. It's a, okay, and there, that's not true, right? So grace gives us the ability to live right, right? It empowers us by the Spirit to live the way God wants us to. It does not give us license, and Paul said that, to live, I don't want to say any way you want to, but to live in sin, right? You should be able to, if you're born again, you should be able to live the way you want to. Now, that does not mean that you get to drink, smoke, cuss, run around, all that stuff. The want to should change, Amen. right? That's what grace does. Grace changes your want to. Grace does not give you license to live sinful. Whatever you used to do that was sin, I got news for you. It's still sin, right? Just because you got saved did not change stealing from being a sin to no longer a sin, right? It's still a sin. Grace changes you so that you no longer have the desire to do that. Amen? Do you understand that? And that's where gr the teaching of grace has gone off. They've got to the point now where, oh, it doesn't matter, nothing matters, and it's, you know, it's, it's the other ditch. Legalism isn't right, and grace isn't right. And the funny thing is, both of them reveal uh, an unchanged heart. Legalism, I got to do right so I'm accepted of God. I got to live perfect. I got to do all these so that I can get acceptance. That's wrong. You don't get acceptance by living right. You live right because you're accepted, right? And because of the change of the nature in you. Now, that's one major teaching that's out there. The other teaching that is good in, in biblical detail, but wrong in the, in when it's taken to an extreme, is the sovereignty of God. That's, a, that's another major one that's out there. Now, you can take the sovereignty of God to the extreme to where everything that happens is God's will. Well, if that's true, then we can just sit down and do nothing because it's all God's will. And if I'm meant to get up and go do it, I'll get up and go do it. And if I'm not, I'll just sit here. But regardless, God's will is going to be done. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to preach. I don't have to pray. I don't have to go out and witness. I don't have to do anything because if it's God's will, they get saved. It'll happen no matter what I do. Right? That's the other extreme. Now, that's not what the Bible calls the sovereignty of God. Right? The sovereignty of God is God's ability to put into the Bible that believers will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. God said in his sovereignty, he said believers can lay hands on the sick. Right? It does not say, his sovereignty does not say, if I want people healed, they're going to get healed no matter what. No, he said my sovereignty is I get to use people to accomplish my will. He said, pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, if God's sovereign and his will is always done, then that is a useless, vain worded prayer because it's going to happen anyway. Amen. So there are the degrees of this that we have to look at and we have to get it in right context in the right degree. And so the, the bad part is both of those teachings show the unchanged heart and both of them go back to basically getting Christians to do nothing. Right? Because that's, that's what that extreme leads to. Now, the sovereignty of God is this. Now, look at this. Jesus said, neither sinned, neither the parents nor the man. And now watch. Jesus' sovereignty or Jesus' mind or his concept or mindset of the sovereignty of God is this. If this man is in front of me and he is blind, then obviously it is so that I can heal him. Not he was made blind so that I can heal him. But the sovereignty of God is because he's blind and because he is now in front of me, then it must be God's will that he be healed. Now see, when you take the sovereignty of God to that, now you become a blessing to the world and not a hindrance to the salvation of the world. Yes. Amen? Do you get that? Imagine, I mean, if you want to take the sovereignty of God in just any doctrine you take and that's all you talk about, eventually you will get into error because you have to take all the doctrines of the Bible together and put them together and no doctrine undoes another doctrine. They all have to fit. Amen? 
So if you would start looking at situations, imagine if you want to take the, the sovereignty of God. Well, everything is God's will. Okay, then not just that person being sick is, but me seeing them has to be God's will. And therefore, since I have the power of God, I'm to set them free. Then obviously, here we are. Let's get it done. And if you believe in the sovereignty of God and you're going to do that, then you've got to heal every person you come into contact with. Amen? Or else you're not walking the way Jesus did. Do you see that? Is that, is that easy enough to understand there? I mean, it's, I'm, I'm trying to pull all this out. Now, he said, <clears throat> but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. And you have to realize that in the Greek, this is not broken up. In the English Bible, we break it up. There's, you know, punctuation, verse numbers. In the original Greek, it's not that way. It's one long line all together, and you have to decide where it breaks up. So if you read it all together, it reads like this. <clears throat> but if or that the works of God should be made manifest in him, I must work the works of him that sent me. In other words, if, if the works of God are going to be manifest in him, I've got to do it. Do you hear that? He wasn't saying, oh, he was born blind so that I get to do this. He was saying, if, if God's works are going to be seen in this man's life, I've got to do it. Now, that's the opposite of the sovereignty of God, the way it's taught, you know, in the error aspect of it. He said, <clears throat> because, or he says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night comes when no man can work. As long as I'm in the world, okay, that's why he's here. That's, that's the while it's day part. I am the light of the world. Well, when he said he was the light of the world, what did he do? He healed a blind man, right? He brought sight, brought light to that man's eyes. <clears throat> then it said, of course, that he spit on the ground and put the mud in the man's eyes and said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. <clears throat> and he went and was healed. Now, in seeing this, Jesus, and this is, I brought this for this point. In Matthew 5, and then we're going to, I'll send you to break here. In Matthew 5, verse 13, Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost his savor, his flavor there, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Then in verse 14, he said, you are the light of the world. Right? So first off, up in John 9, verse 5, he says, I am the light of the world. Then he turns around and says, you're the light of the world. You're going to find out over the next couple of days, everything Jesus said about himself, he said about you. That's how much you are united with him. We always have to remember the, the vine and the branch. If he's the vine, we're the branch, right? Same life flows through. You cannot tell where the vine and the branch cut off if you're looking at the life flowing through it. There is no change of life flowing from the vine to the branch. The only way you can see the difference, if at all, is by looking at the visible outside of the plant, right? The, the same life at the root is the same life flowing through the, the leaves on the branch. It's identical. You can't tell the difference. But he said that he is the vine and we are the branches. That same life flows through us. We are bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. All these words that he has used over and over again to show our union with him. He said that he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit with the Lord. That's how you, united we are. Amen? And what, what hopefully, if I do my job well, which means allow the spirit to work through me freely, by the time we get done here, you will no longer think in terms of him and me but you will think in terms of us, right? Just as if you're married, when you got married, you had to quit thinking me and start thinking us. Amen? And you had to start thinking in terms of we are together, you, which means if you're a man, you know that means that it takes you twice as long to do anything, <laughs> right? You can't just run out and do it. Now, you got to wait for her, amen, <laughs> to be ready and all that other stuff. So you just got you have to make arrangements, all right? Now, that's what we're going to see in this seminar over the next couple of days, is how united you are to him to where, hopefully, you will be able to forget yourself. You won't even... One of the greatest freedoms that I have received through understanding some of this is that I, I never think in terms of, do I have enough faith for this? Do I have enough faith for that? 
Uh, do we have enough money to do this? Do we have enough anything? To, no, whatever we, ha whatever we need to get the job done, we have it. I might not see it. In other words, I may not have it in my pocket, right? But w when I get there, I'll, whatever I need when I get there, I'll have it. I may not have it till I get there. You understand? I may not see it. But whatever I need is there. If, what, if I'm there and this person is sick, if I'm walking through Walmart and there is a sick person there, then taking the position of Jesus, well, if he's here and I'm here, it must be so that I can work the works of him that sent me. And if I'm here to work the works of him that sent me and he has foreordained works that I'm supposed to walk in, so he's already made the provision for me to walk in works, healing the sick, and that person's there, then God's already made the provision for the healing for that person, and he's already made sure that I'm the person that has enough faith to get it done. Yeah. Amen? So I don't even have to think about faith. I don't have to think about power. I don't have to think about anointing. I don't have to think about gifts. It's just me and him in this together. And because we are here and we are one, I have whatever I need to get that person's answer for their need. Amen? Once you start thinking like this, it gets so simple. It's never again, well, I hope I got enough faith for that. Nope. Well, you know, do we have enough money to do that? No. Is it God's will? Yeah. Then, of course, we'll have enough money to do it. Why? It's God's will. And you say, but I already kind of think that way. Okay. What we got to do is get you from thinking that way to believing that way. Because the change is, is believing. The believing is flipping on the switch that allows that to flow. I mean, it's not just thinking, well, yeah, that's, that's good. It is deciding it's truth, and then stepping out like it's truth. And once you do that, that's what causes it to work. Amen? So, y'all take a break. We'll come back in a few minutes, and we'll pick back up here at the end of this.